I wonder if you've ever asked or mentioned or said, uh, this is not how I expected my life would turn out. Ever say that to yourself? I certainly have. I, I want to tell you about Sarah. Sarah was a meticulous planner. From a young age, she had mapped out her entire life. You know people like this? She excelled in school, uh, secured a scholarship to a prestigious university, and planned to become a successful corporate lawyer. Every step of her journey was carefully plotted out in her color-coded book. Okay, I'm hitting the organizers here, right? After graduating with honors, Sarah landed a job at a top law, for, law firm in New York City. She moved into a stylish apartment and started climbing the corporate ladder. And everything seemed to be falling into place just as she had envisioned. Uh, she planned to make partner at the age of 30, get married shortly after, and start a family by 35. However, life was about to take a different direction. One day, while working late on an important case, Sarah received a call that her mother had suffered a severe stroke. Without hesitation, of course, she flew back to her small town to be with her family, and what was supposed to be a brief visit turned into a longer stay as her mother's condition required ongoing care and support. And during this time, Sarah took on the role of a primary caregiver. She balanced hospital visits and therapy sessions and managing all of her mother's affairs. And the demands of her job in New York became overwhelming, and she eventually had to take a leave of absence. And as months turned into a year, Sarah began to reevaluate her life. The rigid plans she had once held so tightly to no longer seemed as important. And she found unexpected joy and fulfillment in being there for her mother, reconnecting with old friends, and becoming involved in her local community. One evening while attending a community event, Sarah met a local doctor named David, and they quickly bonded over their shared experience of caring for loved ones and their passion for helping others. Their friendship blossomed into a deep relationship, and Sarah started to see her life from a different perspective. With David's encouragement, Sarah began volunteering at a local legal aid clinic, providing free legal services to those in need. And this work reignited her passion for law in a way that she had never expected. It was no longer about climbing the corporate ladder, but about making a real difference in people's lives. And years later, Sarah and David would get married in a small, intimate ceremony surrounded by family and friends, and she decided to settle into her hometown permanently, combining her legal expertise with her newfound passion for service to the community. Reflecting on her journey, Sarah would often smile at how different her life had turned out from her meticulously crafted plans. And she realized that the detours and the unexpected turns had led her to a place of deeper purpose and fulfillment. Hindsight is always 2020, right? And Sarah could see how God had guided her to a life that was richer and more meaningful than she had ever imagined, even than she had ever planned. And she lived with a deep and profound sense of hope for the future. The scripture says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Well, this, is, this of course, is one of the most well-known scripture verses in all the Bible. And many of you, like me, have probably put this verse to memory. The words are not just poetic in their composition, but they are a huge encouragement to us as we think of the fact that God has good plans for us, for our good and not our harm, plans to give us hope. Now, these words were written, of course, not to you and me per se, or one particular person, but to the people of God as they found themselves in exile in Babylon. 
And today I hope that you leave this place with a, a better understanding as to how to access the true hope that God wants to pour out on you and me. And that will become possible uh, as you understand not just what Jeremiah under the Lord's direction wrote to the people of God all those years ago, but what he still desires for you and me today. We're in a part two of our series that we're calling Faith, Hope, and Love, which as I pointed out last week, comes to us from the end of 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, the famous love chapter that you hear at a lot of weddings, where Paul writes, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And last week I said that I really believe that these three things, faith, hope, and love, build on top of each other. Remember I said I think of them like as, as a pyramid with faith at the foundation. And really the first two really make it possible ultimately for us to love the way Jesus loved and still love others in our world. And so last week we started with the first of the three of these. We focus on faith, specifically having faith in the face of difficulty. And we're going to continue on in that vein today because faith and hope are really so very similar uh, to each other and absolutely connected. And they both inform how we should approach the difficulties that come up in our life. Now here's our guiding statement for today. Faithfulness to God, uh, faithfulness to God's calling makes hope come alive. Let me say that again. Faithfulness to God's calling or his purpose on your life makes hope come alive. Now we're shifting this week from the New Testament to this often quoted section of the Hebrew Bible out of the prophetic book of Jeremiah. I want to set this up for you uh, 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 for a moment before we dive in. If you were here during our series through the book of Nehemiah in the fall, you might remember that at that point in history, God's people had been in exile in Babylon, what became the Medo-Persian Empire, for years. And the book of Ezra and Nehemiah detail uh, the people of God's return to Jerusalem. But Jeremiah's letter is, comes before uh, to the exiles, and it happens uh, actually while they're in the midst of their exile, during their exile. So they're still 750 miles away from the center of Israel uh, and, and the kingdom of Judah, and uh, they're still in exile. Now, real quick, and this is important to underline, the people of God were exiled because of their repeated disregard and disobedience of God's word and words to them. And this should serve as a reminder for us to remember, even today, and that is that there's always some consequences to our poor decisions. Whether you're a follower of Jesus or not, maybe even especially as a follower of Jesus, our bad decisions have consequence. And just this week, a word of yet another longtime ministry leader stepping down from his post because of an undetailed, sinful decision in his past. And I would just say, pray for me that I finish well, that I remain faithful to God's call on my life. Well, let's jump into our text for today, Jeremiah 29, starting in verse 1. This is the text of the letter that the prophet Jeremiah sent from Jerusalem to the surviving elders among the exiles and to the priests. The prophets and all the other people Nebuchadnezzar had carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. This was after King Jehoiakim and the queen mother, the court officials and the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the skilled workers and the artisans had gone into exile from Jerusalem. He entrusted the letter to Elisha, son of Shaphan, and, and to uh, Gam Gamariah, son of Kilaliah. I actually spent it out, spelt it out phonetically so I wouldn't mess them up, and I just totally messed that up. <laughs> Whom Zedekiah, I can get that one, king of Judah, sent to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. It said, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. 
Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it because if it, if it prof- prospers, you too will prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. This is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now last week we looked at the great chapter in the New Testament about faith, Hebrews chapter 11. And we saw the writer in that chapter, and actually even in the chapters leading up to chapter 11, acknowledging that those followers of Jesus in that moment were, uh, uh, were facing hardship. But not only that, they would continue to face hardship. And so Paul, well, the writer of Hebrews, we don't know who it is, is admonishing them to face that difficulty with faith. And and it's there in Hebrews, and indeed, even here in Jeremiah, the encouragement here is to have faith in the midst of that hardship. And when you do, there's a sure hope that will come to you from God himself. Now, a little context uh, about this passage in particular. I mentioned during our Jonah series just a few weeks ago that the Babylonian Empire was the dominant military force in that part of the world at that time, and and that still is the case uh, earlier on here in Jeremiah, or later on after Jonah in Jeremiah. And Israel had a history of pushing back against the Babylonians. But this time, the emperor Nebuchadnezzar, who uh, who who was in charge at the time, sent an army and conquered Israel again. However, this time, uh, they did more than just merely invade and conquer. The Babylonians employed a strategy common to their empire when dealing with particularly rebellious and subversive societies. They took the professional class and the leaders of Israel into exile, the, the very heart of the nation's leadership and skilled workers. And this, unfortunately, is a strategy that many oppressive regimes over the course of history have employed. More more recently, what comes to mind is the Nazis, as an example. Go after the professors. Go after the artists. uh, Go after the leadership in that culture. And the idea here is to effectively change the culture of the people who have been invaded. And notice who shows up on the list of exiles here. Prophets, priests, the queen mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the two kingdoms, skilled workers, artisans. Essentially, it was the professional classes and leaders who were taken captive and brought to Babylon. Why? Well, as I already alluded to, they were expected to live in Babylon for the next couple of generations, and the aim was for them to culturally assimilate and lose their distinctive beliefs and eventually reach a point where they, had, where they would no longer resist the oppressor. They would no longer resist military domination. Now, here, the exiles could see this strategy, and so when they arrived, they resisted moving into Babylon. They settled outside the city, and like we saw in Jonah, they didn't want to have anything to do with this evil and wicked city, an empire that did so many terrible things to them and others. Now, no doubt, and and you probably have have come across some folks like this, uh, there were people among them, the Lord says that they're false prophets, 
that we're giving them false hope. You ever, you ever meet a, a difficult situation and somebody pipes up just to, just to get the anxiety down and say, to say hey, we're, we're going to get out of this. This is going to last just a short while, right? And the reality is they have no idea how long this oppression or this opposition is going to last. And they're not really hearing from God as to, whether, as to the, the timing of, of when this is going to end. But surely some people were saying, hey, we're, you know, I know we're far away from home, but it's only going to last for a little bit. And uh, then the word, the letter came from the prophet Jeremiah, and it's really nothing short of shocking. The first thing that they had to grapple with was another 70 years in captivity. So all those people are saying, yeah, it's going to one more year and we're, we're good. No, 70 more years, the Lord says. It wasn't going to change in a year or two. And, and, and that's, not, that's a lifetime, right? That's multiple generations. And some of you are saying, Tim, I thought we were talking about hope today. <laughs> we are. Stay with me. And then God says, settle down. Live in the city. Build houses. Plant yourself in this land. Plant yourself a garden. Eat of the fruit of the soil. Verse 6, marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. So God is saying, basically, instead of staying away and not entering into this experience, God is saying, step into it and plant yourself there. Love the people there. Support the city. This is your home now. And then he says, pray to me or pray to the Lord for its prosperity because when it prospers, you will prosper as well. Now, obviously, this was a specific time in, in the history of the people of God that came and went, but I wonder if you can see any similarities with you and me today. You know, in Newbridge, we have people from all over the world, Eastern, Western Europe, Central America, South America, all parts of Asia. I'm sure I missed some, but you all know what it's like to be from another country. And now you're here making a life in a new country. And what God is essentially telling his people here through the prophet Jeremiah is that they are foreigners in a foreign land and he's asking them to settle down and represent him in that land. They are in a sense resident aliens. They live there, but they're from somewhere else. And you know, friends, there is a d discomfort with this idea, isn't there? We like to think of ourselves fully integrated into our culture, right? And there's a sense to which that is absolutely true, but the scripture says that this world is not our home. Paul writes in, the, in Philippians, uh, for our citizenship, citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so just like the Jewish people all those years ago in exile in a foreign land, you and I are citizens of a different land. Not the United States, but heaven. And we're called by God to plant ourselves here in this world, in this place, to build homes, to plant a garden. We keep on talking about doing that. We did it when we were newly married. It's been 26 years since that happened. And we've got the land, uh, but someday we'll plant a garden. Uh, to build homes, to, to pray for peace and prosperity in the place in which we live. But the reality is that we represent a different home. We represent a different place. We represent uh, a, a heaven. And God has sent us on a mission to be agents of hope for those who are in spiritual captivity. Essentially, ultimately, we not, are not citizens of this world. Our home is somewhere else. We're a stranger in this world. We're just passing through because this world is not our home. Now, back to the Jewish exiles. I don't know if you picked up on it or not, but in verse 1 and 2, it says that Nebuchadnezzar brought them to Babylon, from Jerusalem to Babylon, which is true, but it's also true that God brought them to Babylon. Look at verse 4 again. And actually, there's a couple more verses that, that emphasize this point. Verse 4, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those 
I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Again, in verse 7, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Well, which, which is it? And the answer is both. What God is saying here is, I am the sovereign Lord, and I will use whatever and whomever I choose to accomplish my purposes. And for the people of God at this point in history, it meant that God used Nebuchadnezzar, and actually we see him do the, doing that a lot in the, story of, in the various stories involving Nebuchadnezzar, to bring them, the people of God, into this foreign, foreign place. Listen, wherever you are, and whatever season of life you might find yourself in, know that God has played a primary role in how things have unfolded. Sure, there have been other players that have influenced your position in life, but don't forget that God has a purpose for you and that he's orchestrated your lives accordingly. And then God says through his prophet in verse 10 and 11, essentially, I've got a purpose for you here in this place. Plant yourself in the city. Don't stay away. In fact, don't decrease, he says, but increase in that place. Essentially, he's saying, I want you to be ambassadors. Now, he doesn't use that terminology, but as we're going to see, it shows up in the New Testament quite frequently. But essentially, what God is saying is to hear, hear in Jeremiah is, be an ambassador for me. Represent your homeland to this foreign people. Now think with me for a moment uh, what it means to be an ambassador. I grew up on the same street, First Avenue, as the United Nations. I, I counted actually just 16 blocks south of the United Nations. And I went to school with children of diplomats. Some of them were my very good friends. And you know, it's not an easy thing to come from another country and live in, in, a, in what it, to you is a foreign place and represent your country. You have to adjust to the culture around you, but you don't have to completely lose your culture. In fact, many people who find themselves in a different culture go to great lengths to what? To keep their culture uh, alive or the culture of their country of origin alive. And this is the story of America, right? people groups uh, settling in certain places. This is how neighborhoods become known as Italian neighborhoods or Irish neighborhoods. Donna was just telling me this week about the history of Morristown and how so many Irish settled here in Morristown. And when that happens, what begins to happen is that uh, shops open up that sell things from home, right? Cultural centers emerge where food and dance and traditions of home are celebrated in this new land. And what I want to point out to you this morning is that that church, the gathering of God's people, is in a sense a cultural center. It's, it's much more than that. But in a sense, it's a cultural center that reminds us of our true home that celebrates the culture of the kingdom. This is why Jesus, before he went to the cross at that last supper, said, when you eat, drink of this cup and eat of this bread, remember me. This is a, this is a remembrance of him. This is a cultural uh, a rehearsal of home. This is what home is, to be in the body of Christ, to be in communion and abide, abide with Jesus. It's also not an easy, to rep easy thing to represent the kingdom, right? It might be one thing to come into this place and, and talk about home, talk about our future home, but talk about our citizenship in heaven. But God has planted us in workplaces, in neighborhoods to represent the kingdom of God. And that's exactly what he's called us to do. And as we do that, we can be sure now, here's where the hope comes in, we can be sure that hope is given to us. That God's plans for us are for us and not against us. That as we live and serve him in this world, our hope is sure and true. 
And in the age of the church that we are living in and have been for the past 2,000 years, I am here to tell you that we were given the same mandate by God just like those exiles back in the day. God is asking us to be ambassadors where we live and where we work that our home is not here, that we might just be passing through, but we represent the king and we're ambassadors for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. That's a very humbling verse. When, when I get up here on Sundays, when, when I prepare these messages each week, I am painfully aware of my sin, of my shortcoming. And I recognize that when I bring the word of God, I am an unholy vessel many times. That I am imperfect, that, I, that this is a great mantle that God has placed on me. And so my prayer is, God, fill in all the spaces. I am your imperfect servant, and I'm here to serve you as best I can. Fill in all of the spaces. As though God was making his appeal through us. And and I just want to say real quick, this is not just talking at people. This is serving the poor. This is loving people who who you don't agree with politically or theologically. This is the people that you live with, the people that you work with. You're from another home, but you represent the king. And that means loving people well. Paul writes about himself to the Ephesians. I am an ambassador. He's writing this in jail. I'm an ambassador in chains. Even when I'm in jail, I'm singing hymns. I'm praising the Lord in that place. And and jailers are coming to Christ because I represent the king. Even in this uncomfortable jail cell, I represent him. Now, one of the questions you might be asking this morning is, Tim, what if I feel hopeless? I've had seasons of hopelessness. And I trust many of you, if not all of you, have as well. And maybe today that is the season that you are in right now. I think the scripture teaches here and throughout the Bible that there is something to living into the purpose that God has called you to. Let me say that again. There's something to living into, stepping into, leaning into the purpose that God has called us to. And if we're unclear about what that is, or we're pushing back against it, then the result is that we don't have much hope. But hope is sure when we are living out our purpose and calling. And our primary calling, which is shared by each one in this room and each one of you listening on the live live stream, to borrow from the Westminster Shorter Catechism, is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That's our purpose. Now, each of us have a unique purpose. We would call that a secondary calling. But our primary calling is to praise God and to enjoy him forever. And then as we grow in the knowledge of Christ, as we grow in relationship with him, he says, okay, I have something specific for you. I believe each one of you have a unique calling that God has given only to you. You are truly unique. And God has called you to something. And he wants you to know what that is. But you know, if we don't live into that calling, then we find ourselves wanderingly, wandering hopelessly in this world. Hope comes from being in connection with the king. But as we close today, here's what I want you to know and remember. And I don't know how long I've, I've gone, but hopefully uh, you're still with me. Is that hope came to us. Hope came, I I love the way Eugene Peterson translates uh, John chapter 1. He says, hope took on flesh and bones and moved into the neighborhood. Hope moved into the neighborhood, and his name is Jesus. See, ultimately, the gospel is about all sorts of things, but it's about hope. It's the good news that we have a Savior 
who took flesh and blood and lived among us and, and gives us hope. He came to rescue us, and, and not just for a future reality, but right now, friends. And as he lived his life in a human body, he showed us what it looked like to, be, to remain faithful in what seemed like a hopeless situation as he went to the cross, right? Father, would you take this cup from me? But then he says, not my will, but yours be done. See, there's him stepping into the purpose that the Father had given him. And out of his faithfulness to the Father's call, hope arose from the ashes. And so our first job as we seek to know and glorify God and enjoy him forever is to receive the hope that he gives us and then bring it to others. See, it's not just for you to consume. We're real good at consuming in the United States. I, uh, something came up in my uh, Facebook feed. My daughter always is telling me that I, I fall for the uh, Facebook advertisements. She's partially right. I bought some teachers t-shirts recently, and she's like, where'd you get those? And I was like, I saw an ad, and I bought some t-shirts. I needed some new ones. So yeah, I mean, those robots know what I'm looking for. But I, I saw this little, little short documentary on this buffet in the state of Pennsylvania, just in Amish country, and it's this enormous, I, I can't, I, it's a smorgasbord, and all-you-can-eat buffet. And, you know, and one of the lines that the, the person who was doing the documentary said, Americans like to have excess, right? They like to have more than they actually need. All that to say that we can dine on the smorgasbord of the gospel, but the purpose is not to hold it for ourselves. The purpose is to give it away. The purpose is to love others. And that's where we're going to get to next week as we move through this series. Listen, I want you to know this morning that he has good plans for you. And I know some of you have faced tremendous adversity. I know what that's like. And some of you are facing that adversity right now. But he wants to prosper you. And he's generous, and he gives hope freely, and he secures your future. You see, the message of Jer Jeremiah 29 to us, and even as it was back when it was written, is that God has placed you wherever you find yourself, where you live, the circumstances of your life. He has placed you there even with all of the challenges that it entails, and he wants you to exercise faithfulness and obedience to the purpose for which he has called you. And in that place, hope will arise. It might be hard to see right now, and your circumstances might feel a bit hopeless. My question to all of us today is, are we remaining faithful? Are we laser focused on honoring him and trusting in his plan and purpose? If we are, then we're not wandering aimlessly as we travel the road that he has marked out for us. He has prepared us to walk that road. But I want a, a word of caution, be mindful of the detours. It's easy to take a detour. So often we're tempted to choose comfort over faithfulness and obedience, right? Present company included. What would it look like if we more often than not chose him over everything and everyone else? I tell you, we would be a whole lot more content regardless of what is going on around us because he is the prize. And when we're pursuing him with wild abandon, we are swimming in an ocean of hope. And we know exactly who we are and what we're called to do. In those places, there's no confusion. There's only a certain hope that brings peace, not only to our souls, but to everyone that encounters us. You ever been around somebody that's always anxious? They're always moving. They're always making changes. They're changing their minds. Someone whose timing, especially it seems as important decisions are upon them, always seem to be either late or too early. Or, but rarely on time. I don't know if I'm talking about any of you today, but I see some smiles. 
That is someone, and I, really, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. So this is someone who is not in step with God and his will. Listen, we've all been there. We've all made rash decisions. And when we find ourselves in that place, the answer is to take a breath, to be still, to recognize that God still sits on the throne and to watch and to listen for his leading, trusting in his purposes and his plans and not our own. Faithfulness to God's calling makes hope come alive. I want to close today with a few words from the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans. We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has poured out, has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who's been given to us. Amen and amen. Would you pray?